the 13th chapter of John. And the whole action in this 13th chapter has taken place at the last supper that Jesus had shared with his friends. Yes, the last supper. Not merely the final meal, but the same last supper that the other gospel writers tell us about. He shares this meal with the people that he would send out to evangelize the whole world. And before he sends them out, he eats one last meal with them. And it is at this meal that he gave to them and through them us the greatest gift that we will ever receive. He gives all that he is, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is the meal at which Jesus instituted our Eucharistic celebration. Now, the Synoptic Gospels give us those words of institution. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his friends and said, take this all of you and eat it. This is my body. We in the Catholic Church didn't make that stuff up. It comes from the very words and actions of Jesus as testified to by the author of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and also St. Paul. And my goodness, if you've read St. Paul, you know he never says anything that he is not 100% sure of, okay? The Catholic Church takes part in this very same sacrifice of Jesus every time we celebrate Mass. We are present once again at his table. This part of the Mass, and you'll hear it pronounced two different ways. Some people call it anemnesis. Brian Lewensi from the Archdiocese uses anemnesis, regular people like us usually say anamnesis. So however you hear it pronounced, what we're referring to is a remembering. And not a remembering that we do with our memories or our mind alone. It's sacramental. It is an active remembering, a becoming again, the people who were present at that original table. We remember what Jesus said and did at his Last Supper. And in the remembering, that moment is made present to us once again. The sacrifice that Jesus made once for all is represented on our altar every time we celebrate Eucharist. The Gospel of John may not give us the words that the other Gospels and Paul do, but he definitely links this last meal to the Passover. John tells us that Jesus himself would be passing over from life to death, going home to the Father. And before he does, <coughs> he performs one last act for those he loved to the end. 
He rises from a Eucharistic banquet, from a table at which no words have been said. It seems as though there's no need for words. It seems as if for a moment that heaven and earth have come together and they're linked at John's banquet table just like they are every time we celebrate Mass. Now, before we continue with our discussion of the Last Supper, <coughs> I would like to read you a portion of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Okay? And you will be very, very familiar with it. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found in human appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him a name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And now you're sitting there saying, okay, we're studying John. Why is she reading Paul to us? Well, because I want to draw some connections between that passage and what we're seeing in this washing of feet. Paul borrows that piece. It is a hymn that was sung in the early church, and Paul uses it to declare the doctrine of incarnation. God putting on flesh. And the hymn explains the incarnation as a self-emptying, a humbling, a taking on the form of a slave, becoming human. All of this is a part of what Paul refers to in several of his epistles. All of this is part of God's great mystery and part of God's love for us. Because in the self-emptying of Jesus is God's great glory. I suggest to you that as we look at this foot washing in John 13, you're going to see what Paul was talking about because John 13 plays out this passage. And taking on human form and becoming like a slave begins the book of glory. Now we finished last week with the book of signs and we saw Jesus throughout these first 12 chapters 
coming from the Father, revealing himself in signs of wonder and power. We see him extend the invitation of salvation to everybody. Everybody who has faith. And now his hour has come. And his hour, his humiliation, his passion, and death bring us into the book of glory. Now, not the way we define glory, because we read this and, oh my goodness, doesn't seem too glorious to us. This is the way God defines glory. Jesus is about to take on the form of a slave, as Paul told the Philippians, and allow himself to be crucified. And he lays down his life willingly. In this, God's glory will be seen, because we know he is going to highly exalt Jesus, as Paul tells us in Philippians, and God will validate, say yes to, affirm, approve everything that Jesus said and did throughout his entire life. And he does this in the resurrection. Jesus doesn't raise himself. God the Father raises Jesus and gives him that glorified body. And how does this hour, does this glory begin? With the washing of feet. This self-abasement and humility of the crucifixion is clearly the meaning of the foot washing, according to renowned Bible scholar Raymond D. Brown. We're told in verse 1 that Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. And the first thing he did, he rose from this banquet table took off his outer garments and tied that towel of service around his waist and began to wash feet. Feet! This was a service that you could not even ask a Jewish slave to perform in the Roman Empire. It was considered to be too demeaning, even for a slave. Come on, feet! Among people who walk all over a place, in the sand, feet are dirty. They stink. They step in nasty things. Who wants to wash feet? And we're not talking baby's feet, people. Baby's feet are tiny and soft and tender and innocent. These are the feet of fishermen. I don't know that I would want to be washing them. Some of the early church fathers saw in this action that self-emptying that Paul talks about. The shedding of the outer garments is the shedding of the outward covering of divinity. And the tying on of that towel was defined as putting on humanity and becoming a servant to all. Jesus came to serve, and he did so in so many ways. Some theologians refer to Jesus as the servant king. 
His final act of service was surrendering totally to the will of God and laying down his very life for those he loved to the end. It was the supreme act of service. The foot washing is a prophetic action which alludes to the final humiliation and service of the crucifixion. The public act of Jesus on Calvary and his private act in the presence of his disciples are alike in that each is an act of service and love. Each is an act of humility. Each shows us how very precious we are to Jesus. It tells us we are his own. We are his own that he loves to the end if we have faith. If we believe, if we follow, if we have been bathed in the waters of baptism. Now, for his disciples present, their baptism would not come, their baptism in the Spirit would not come until Pentecost, but they weren't aware of that. They don't yet have the full understanding of what's going on, and they don't understand the significance of any of this. The Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about, ever notice when you read the Catechism, they use really big words? The Catechism talks about God's divine pedagogy. All that means is that God reveals things to us little by little as we're able to understand, just like we do with our children, our grandchildren, right? We are part of God's divine pedagogy. We have learned well. Jesus even tells Peter as he approaches him, you don't understand this now. You will understand this later. And Jesus means in the crucifixion. Well, you know, Peter is Peter. Peter doesn't quite get it yet. Peter in the Synoptic Gospels is the one that Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. When Jesus is saying the Messiah has to suffer and die, and Peter goes, oh, no. Well, here he is. The rock upon whom the church is to be built is not only the foundation rock, he's sort of rocky in the head. Doesn't get it, just like us, okay? He doesn't quite get it. It doesn't fit with his image of who Jesus is. This is a demeaning act. You are not a slave. We call you Lord and Master. We know that you're the Messiah. Please get up off your knees. And even after Jesus says, you'll understand later, he still says, you will never wash my feet. But this is how Judas and Peter are different. Jesus explains to Peter what is really at stake in this washing. And he says to him, unless I wash you, you can have no inheritance with me. Well, Peter's a good Jew. He gets that. 
Okay? The chosen people's inheritance in the Old Testament was the promised land. In the New Testament, as they gradually came to believe in an afterlife, this inheritance became the promised land of heaven for many of them. So Jesus is telling Peter, you will not be with me in paradise unless you allow this washing to take place. If Peter wants to be saved, he must be washed in the salvific death of John's sacrificial lamb. How can this not be a symbolic act pointing to what happens the next day in the crucifixion? And when Peter understands that this washing is essential for his salvation, he gives another Peter-like response. Okay, Lord, then not just my feet, but my head and my hands as well. And then Jesus says something that's a little curious. Whoever has bathed has no need except to have his feet washed, for he's clean all over. So you are clean. And then he adds, because he knows about Judas, but not all. Okay. All of a sudden, the words have changed. He's not talking about a washing. The word isn't wash. The word is bathed. Bathing was the way the early church referred to baptism. We are bathed in the waters of baptism. We are made new, we are cleansed, and we, from that moment on, share the inheritance of Jesus. We are adopted sons and daughters of God. We have the right to call God Abba. We become brothers and sisters of Christ and in Christ through that baptismal bathing. Those who have been baptized have their sins washed away. The stain of original sin removed. And they only have an occasional need of washing. Sound like reconciliation to you? That's how many, many Bible scholars and early church fathers interpreted that phrase, that we're talking about the sacraments of baptism and reconciliation. So Jesus shares his last meal, performs this last act with his disciples, trying to explain what was about to happen and what it means to them. And then he asks them, do you understand what I've done for you? And his disciples are told, go and do likewise. Who? Them? Us? Whoa. Scary thought, isn't it? Is Jesus calling us to be servants? Are we supposed to wash each other's feet? And exactly what form does that washing take? Do you realize what he has done for us? He came to us as a child, innocent, weak, poor. And the world did not know him or even care 
about his existence. In a world of violence and oppression, he offers peace. In a world where possessions are counted and numbered, he owned nothing and says, that's okay, because God will take care of you. In a world where people stepped on each other, he washed their feet and asks us to do the same. Do you realize what he's done for us? In a world where we're afraid to get involved, he spoke the truth and gave his very life for it. In a world divided against itself, he offered himself as a center a rallying point for the prudent and the clever and the educated of his day. He became a sign of confusion and contradiction for the helpless, the poor, the marginalized of society. He stood with them broke bread with them. And he asks us, do you understand what I have done for you? You look to experts for deliverance, but I bring a different kind of wisdom. You put your faith in security and material wealth and government, but I ask you, have faith in me. You believe in holding on to what you have. But I gave everything for you. You're sometimes so hard on each other. But I was gentle with you. You would lock the doors of your homes and countries to strangers. But I keep my doors open to you. You look for security through strength, but I was totally vulnerable to you. Some think they owe nothing to the poor but I am the poor to which you owe everything. You think that life is an avoidance of death, but I invite you into life through my passion and death. So do you understand what I have done for you? You call me Lord and Master, and rightly so. I am. If I then, the Lord and Master, have washed your feet in any way whatsoever, You should do the same for each other. I have given you example. Go and do likewise. Amen. Lord God, we ask you for your gifts of wisdom and strength, discernment, love, and oh yes, faith. 
Help us to hear your word, to read your word, and live your word. Help us, Lord, to be able to find the balance to your total self-abasement and humility and to what you're calling us to individually in our lives, in our parish, in our nation and world. And Lord, help us to do what our opening song calls us to do. Every day, pick up the towel and the basin. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and brother. Amen.